Welcome family. Welcome family. How are you guys doing? My name is Sean Marais. And my name is Percy. And it's so great to be with you guys today. So why don't you take a moment mm -hmm. while you're here, while we're in this festive moment. Yes. Why don't you share the word right now with someone? Why don't you make sure that you're followed to all our social media platforms mm -hmm. that you're not missing out on anything. We have such amazing series, such amazing yeah. content that we've already had a backlog of. And we just want to make sure that you guys aren't missing out. That mm -hmm. if there's a word that you need for today, yeah. that you know that you can find 30 minutes of inspiration and get the hope that Jesus Christ has for so us. So good. That is so good. Family, we want to just take a moment to say thank you for your yes. generosity. Thank you for faithfully sowing and standing and partnering with us in this ministry. Mm -hmm. We really just pray that the Lord will abundantly bless you and your family. Yes. So if you need the details of where to sow, they're on the screen and also in the inbox in the chat down below. Yes, yes. Awesome. Let's just quickly pray over that mm -hmm. seed, Percy. Absolutely. Why don't you pray for us? So thank you, Lord, that you are the provider. Thank you mm -hmm. that you are our source. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for each and every single seed that is sown into this ministry, that you are faithful, Father God, because you know the heart in which it is given. So we thank you for each and every single cheerful giver, Father yes, God, that they yes. may be blessed in abundance. Amen. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're excited for week two of the book of Matthew. Pastor Julian, take us away. Hey there, family. My name is Julian. I'm one of the pastors here at Every Nation Faith City, and I'm super excited to share week two of our new sermon series on the book of Matthew with you. So uh, last week, we kind of just gave a general overview. Today, we're going to dive into one of the most famous sermons of all time. Uh, but uh, before we do that, uh, have you ever been on an airplane and then right before takeoff, uh, the, the, the air hostesses will usually end up giving you, uh, the flight attendants will give you this lovely speech on, okay, how do you connect uh, your seat belt? How do you uh, put on a mask if a part of the plane is missing? You know, just, just basic things like that. Now, usually your first and your second time when you're on a plane, you pay very close attention. You're taking notes. But after a while, you tend to just avoid eye contact and put in headphones. Or you try to find a way to like just pass the time because you're not paying attention, especially if you fly a lot. It's arguably one of the most important things you need to know whenever you're flying. And yet, a lot of times we zone out because we've heard it so many times or because we think we have a down pat. But I can guarantee you, like a couple of times I've thought about this and, and thought, you know what? I think this is actually super important, but I am not 100% sure if I'd remember how to do all this. Uh, because I, I haven't been paying attention because I've heard it so many times. Now, I think a lot of times there are certain passages in Scripture that because we've heard it so many times or because it's, it's familiar to us content-wise or idea-wise, we tend to tune it out. And I want to encourage us today that even though we're talking about one of the most important and one of the most uh, uh, commonly used Scriptures in the Bible, arguably, I want to encourage you not to tune it out, but to really pay attention because this is something that could save your life and change the way you live forever. Now, uh, let's pray real quick. Thank you, God, that you're so good. Thank you that you're faithful. Thank you that today we can go back to your word and go back to the promises in your word, but also to hear the things that you've spoken as if for the first time. And Lord, help us not to tune it out because we've heard it before, but to really press into what you're saying because this can change your lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we look at the sermon, let's look at how people reacted to the message. So in Matthew 7, verse 28, this is after this famous sermon, the people reacted like this. They said, now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching. The original word in the original language was actually they were out of their minds or rather our equivalent would be their minds were blown. They did not expect to hear from Jesus what Jesus said. 
The answers Jesus gave weren't answers that they wanted or expected. And these answers weren't common sense. So let me put it in context here. If you're living in a country that's being oppressed by a corrupt government and by a foreign army, what you would end up doing is, if someone tells you, look, there's gonna be a savior who's gonna redeem you, you're gonna think, okay, there's gonna be a change in government. There's gonna be a new leader coming in. Someone's gonna come in guns blazing and destroy the enemy. Now imagine if that person comes in and that's not their plan. This is exactly what happened to the people uh, of Israel during that time is they were being oppressed by this other nation. And what ended up happening is they were expecting the Messiah to come and to pretty much wipe out the Romans and wipe out the corrupt government and become the new physical king on earth. The son of David was going to become the next King David and it was going to be glorious. And here comes Jesus. And he tells them that he's the Messiah. But the kingdom that he pitches to them is an upside down kingdom. They wanted a military ruler, but they got Jesus, king of the upside down kingdom. God wanted a community that would contrast with the world around them. And when, when he spoke to the people, what happened is he brought, he specifically used words and phrases to not just tell them, uh, just, just to preach a normal sermon, but he used words and phrases as if he was pitching a new government. And that's something super unique that you see, and that's something just to keep in mind as we go on. But before we, before we dive into the sermon, I'm making you guys wait just a little bit longer. So in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, uh, we see a new covenant being foretold by the prophet Jeremiah. He said the following, he said, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. So I'm just going to pause there. So the original covenant was not kept. He said this is going to be different. Not different as in, uh, the, the, the content necessarily, but they didn't keep their covenant. They didn't keep their part of the agreement. And so back to the scripture, he says, though I was their husband, says the Lord. So even though he was faithful, they weren't faithful. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So this is what the prophet foretold. He said there's going to come a new covenant because what ended up happening is God redeemed these people out of slavery. And he, he speaks to them via Moses on, uh, on Mount Sinai. And what happens is he tells them, look, these are the terms of our relationship. Just like if you start dating someone or if you get married, there are certain vows that you make towards the other person. God was 100% faithful to his side of the agreement, but we weren't. The people back then weren't faithful. They kept the letter of the law in certain cases, but even then they didn't keep the law because they missed the heart behind it. So what God said is, I'm coming to bring a new law. I'm bringing a new thing, new commitments. We're making new vows towards each other. But this time, it's not going to be like the previous time where people aren't going to get the heart of it. I want people to understand the heart behind these vows. I don't want new vows. I want you to get the heart behind these vows that we're here in the first place. I want to get you to understand that it's not just about fulfilling the letter of the agreement. I want you to do this out of love. I don't want a change of actions. I want a change of heart. And this is what we see. A covenant is a commitment. And like any relationship, there are things that both parties agree on. Like, well, don't cheat on me, for instance. <laughs> and yet, even when the people didn't keep it, God stayed faithful. God is a lot more interested in changing the root than just the fruit. God is a lot more interested in changing the root and not just the fruit. 
And this drum roll is the heart behind the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is a scripture, like I said, uh, that you've probably heard countless times before. But the heart behind the Sermon on the Mount isn't to give you a bunch of new rules. It's to renew your vows. It's to realize these are the heart. Uh, this is the heart behind these new, uh, these new laws, if you will, uh, behind these new vows. So Matthew uh, 5 verse 17 starts, and Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Back then, law and prophets was shorthand for the word of God. Uh, so it was their Bible. It was the Torah at the time. So do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to do away with them. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Verse 18, For I truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. I'm not changing my vows, is what Jesus was saying. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these commandments or teaches other people to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For truly I tell you, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, like we talked about earlier, the law here refers to the Torah and to the books of the Old Testament. It was their Bible. So God didn't come to show us the loopholes or how to cheat on our relationship with Him. He came to show us what the rules were really about. The Sermon on the Mount uh, talks about the following topics. It talks about uh, murder, it talks about adultery, it talks about promises, revenge, and how to deal with enemies. And what Jesus did is, and something that you'll see is, uh, I wanna encourage you to read these passages yourself as well in your own Bible study, um, or with a small group. If you don't have a connect group or a small group, uh, please let us know in the comments and uh, we'll help you get connected. Um, but I wanna, I wanna highlight the following section in the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5, verse 21 and 24, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, uh, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or a sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell fire, to the hell of fire. So, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and sister and then come and offer your gift. So what Jesus was doing is he's actually talking about murder. He's talking about how a lot of times we draw the line in a certain place, but God draw, draws the line a lot closer to our hearts than we'd like it to be. So the pattern that he follows throughout the Sermon on the Mount is he does the following. He says, you have heard, and then he talks about, this is the original law that you, that you pretty much were working with. But I'm telling you the following. Now, what's interesting here is, imagine if someone was preaching a sermon and they told you, this is what the Bible says, but I tell you, and then they raise the standard. You'd look at them weird. You'd be like, you are not God and you're claiming to be God by saying it this way. This is exactly what Jesus was doing. He was not claiming to be a pastor. He was play, claiming to be God. And that offended people. It's, it's not every day where your pastor claims to be God, nor should your pastor claim to be God. They're not God. In this case, what ended up happening is Jesus was actually God. So he can make the claim that he's God. But that offended people. But the reason why he made that claim wasn't to just mess with people, but he wanted to fix the root and not the fruit itself. He wanted to make sure that the root of the issue was sorted out. So the Sermon on the Mount doesn't address our behavior, it addresses our hearts. I actually wanna conclude on this. I'm gonna read that same passage again. Matthew 5, verse 21 to 24. You have heard that it was said, to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you'll be liable to judgment. 
And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to hell. So what Jesus here was doing here is he was addressing the issue of murder. As humans, we want to stop at the point of violence. Hey, you're not allowed to be violent. You're not allowed to act on this. God wanted to stop at the point of unforgiveness. He said, hey, this is the actual issue we need to deal with. I want to deal with the heart of this. Because the murder, this action, stems out of this feeling, out of this heart. So what Jesus says here is he says, who do you need to make peace with? If the only reason why you don't cheat on someone is because you're not allowed to, then there's still a heart issue that needs to be dealt with. In the same way, <laughs> what Jesus ended up doing is he said, I want you to deal with a heart issue. Why do you want to cheat on the person in the first place? Why do you want to cheat in your relationship with God? The issue of cheating itself is almost irrelevant. The issue is the heart behind it. We want to stop at violence. God wants to stop at unforgiveness. So I want to ask each and every one of us today, who do you need to make peace with? In order to deal with the issue of murder in our lives, whether we physically murdered someone or not, we need to deal with the issue of unforgiveness. Actually, funny enough, while I was writing this sermon, and I was specifically getting to this part, it hit me that I needed to make peace with someone. It hit me that, you know what, I'm literally writing a sermon on the Sermon of the Mount, on before you continue to do what you're doing now, you need to stop, you need to go make peace. God says, I'll wait for you to make peace before you make the sacrifice to me. We need to work on the issue of murder. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but I think the thing that ended up hitting me is, you know what, this is a lot of times why uh, we're, we're struggling with different areas and we feel like, God, like, I want, I want to, like, get to the important things. And God's looking at situations like this and he's going, this is the important thing I need you to work on. I need you to work on forgiveness. I know you're not murdering anyone, but let's deal with the heart behind this. So I want to, I want to, uh, encourage you to do two things. Number one, to read through the Sermon on the Mount and look through those things and saying, God, instead of just going, okay, check, I didn't murder anyone, but to go, Lord, who do I need to forgive? God, okay, I didn't cheat on my wife, but Lord, am I looking lustfully towards someone? Am I wishing that I was in a different relationship? And I also want to encourage each and every one of us today, who do you need to make peace with? I want to encourage you right now, pause the video if you have to, but go and make peace with that person. The really cool thing is that you might already have someone in mind. <laughs> the person might be in the room with you. I'm sorry if that's the case. <laughs> but it's a great opportunity for us to practice what God preached, what Jesus preached, and what we're preaching right now. And I want to encourage you. So when you are offering at your gift at the altar. If you remember that you have a brother or sister who has something against you, leave your gift and go. First be reconciled and then come and offer your gift because God doesn't just want to fix the fruit. He wants to fix the root. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're so good. Help us not to just look at the letter of the law, to look at the physical things that, that, that are surrounding us right now, but to actually to address the heart of the issue. Not because we have to, but because <laughs> we want to. And Lord, thank you that in areas where we don't necessarily want to change as of yet, you come and you change our hearts and you give us the desire to change as well in those areas. And Lord, in times where we're alone and we feel like, you know what, there's no one else around me to help me right now. Lord, thank you that you place us in community and you help us to reach out towards those communities as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. That so, was a powerful word. I, that was really powerful. I got no words to say. <laughs> I, so I loved how our sure. Apostle Julian put it mm. that we are that we're not just called to 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 get out of the to get the fruit out of our lives, the mm. poison fruit, but we're getting at the roots, and wow. that's what God has called us for. Mm. 
and first off, well done to Pastor Gillum because yeah, there's like absolutely. 20 sermons that he could have picked out of that <laughs> passage of scripture. So why don't you, yeah. in this week, mm. take it as a time of devotion. Read through from Matthew 4 to the to, to chapter 7 yeah. and it is just so filled with so many amazing things mm. and why don't you check out one of the other services that will be happening today or later on on one of our channels mm. to see some of the other perspectives from these books like if anything inspires you yes. please please get in contact with us we would really like to hear what stood mm. out for you personally in your devotions throughout the week on various social media platforms and yes. if you really need prayer family we are here to stand with you and pray with you so please get in contact with us we have a team that is ready to yes. pray with you awesome that's all from us be blessed and we'll see you next time